this afternoon, this evening, I'm going to talk to you about um, depobuprenorphine, just some disclosures. So I'm an investigator on three current studies of depobuprenorphine in Australia, um, two of them involving the Cameras, the Swedish uh, medication, and one of them, the Indivia medication. Um, and I'd also just like to acknowledge and thank um, Nick Lindsayus and Marianne Byrne for sharing some slides. I've also got a couple of slides from um, the companies Indivia and Cameras, and they're marked um, clearly on the slides. So just briefly to go off the learning objectives to start. So um, the plan today is to provide a brief summary of two depot preparations uh, in the process of being registered in Australia. Buvidal uh, or Buvidal, uh, weekly and monthly, and Subblockade, which is a monthly preparation, uh, to discuss the current clinical trials in Australia with these medications, um, discuss prescribing issues with depot pre uh, in preparations, and explore medium and long-term possible impacts on the opiate treatment system in Australia. So to start, um, just an overview of opiate treatment history in Australia. So uh, in um, 50 years or so, we've had two medications. Uh, it's interesting to say contrast with hepatitis C treatment where there's been over a de dozen medications in a decade. We haven't been quite so fortunate. So methadone, uh, obviously in Australia since the late 1960s, uh, buprenorphine um, around 2000, 2001, we started to have access to buprenorphine in, in Australia. So um, two medications, a few different preparations in 50 years, it's not an enormous number. So um, I'm uh, quite excited about another uh, preparation at least of an opiate-based medication for treatment in Australia. And you'll get to hear why. But just briefly going over methadone and buprenorphine, clearly um, there's the difference in agonist effects. So methadone is the full agonist, buprenorphine being a partial agonist and some particular properties of buprenorphine, it's high receptor affinity and lower intrinsic activity. Um, the Australian opiate treatment system, uh, one of the key things about it is was that it was expanded to prevent HIV in injecting drug users um, from the mid 1980s on. Uh, and this was predominantly through um, access via GPs, Medicare funded being uncapped. That's been the biggest growth. There has been some growth uh, in the public treatment system and there's been some growth by jails over the last decade, decade and a half. Uh, implementing methadone and buprenorphine, but the bulk of the increase has been treatment delivered in primary care. We've got a mixed system, so uh, in New South Wales, um, public clinics um, and private clinics. Uh, general practice and community pharmacy, however, is, is the predominant, the major form of treatment in Australia. Um, and it accounts for something like 80% of all the dosing happens in community pharmacies. A key thing um, that, that separates us, say, from the US with their buprenorphine or France with their buprenorphine uh, is essentially our system is, has been adopted from a methadone system and it's based on daily supervised dosing uh, with some takeaways allowed, but a daily supervised type model. Um, it's relatively accessible um, and, and somewhat affordable, but not for all. Uh, and the patient co-payment, if you're at a community pharmacy, is significant. So around about $2,000 a year, but up to $5,000 a year, sometimes more. Uh, and given the, the lack of increase of, um, of unemployment benefits over the last couple of decades, that is an ongoing creeping proportion of people's, um, people's costs who are on methadone or buprenorphine at our community pharmacies. Um, we have an ageing cohort, um, two thirds men, uh, Indigenous people about 8%. Sorry, I'll try to mute for all of the flight announcements. Unfortunately, there's gonna be a few of them. So um, we have about just under 40,000, sorry, 50,000 people in treatment on methadone and buprenorphine in Australia. You can see that growth that I was talking about before, predominantly in primary care through the 1990s into the 2000s. So buprenorphine um, came along in 2001 pretty rapidly. It became about a third uh, of all of the treatment was uh, patients being treated with buprenorphine, but it really hasn't grown in the last decade. Um, to just quickly talk about methadone and buprenorphine. So clearly both effective um, treatments for opiate use disorder, um, essentially equivalent at high doses, although you'll see the flexible dose studies, the retention in treatment with buprenorphine isn't quite as good as it is with methadone, so 83%. Um, 
equally effective in, in um, reducing opiate positive urine. So you can see from the Cochrane review, uh, opiate positive urines, there's no significant difference between methadone treatment and buprenorphine treatment. And similarly on self-reported heroin use, uh, there's no difference. But just getting back to that issue of uh, retention in treatment, it's probably better described by this data linkage study that the folks at um, NDARC published a couple of years ago now. So this is a retrospective um, data set looking at the people enrolled into the New South Wales opiate treatment system uh, and it looks at their attention in treatment. Now there'll be some error in the data set because doctors don't always promptly um, submit their forms when patients discontinue treatment. So if anything it'll overestimate uh, retention and treatment slightly and you can see this quite striking um, curve of retention in treatment. Um, Methadone uh, clearly has a much higher retention uh, in treatment than buprenorphine. I think it's a, the median's about 420 odd days compared to 120 days with buprenorphine in that particular cohort. Uh, so, so clearly there's much uh, increased um, retention with methadone compared to buprenorphine and I think that's probably what folks tend to see generally clinically. Um, the same group uh, in a different paper published a couple of years earlier looked at the same data set um, enrolments into treatment and, and it have had this interesting finding that the, even though the number of patients in treatment grew, uh, and this is New South Wales specific data over that time, uh, the, the, the proportion who are actually new patients to treatment, so hadn't previously resisted in treatment, was, was small and somewhat consistent. So you see it's around about a thousand, sometimes up to two thousand dollars, that's the, the, the lower black line. Uh, and we see more people coming in and out of treatment uh, and that's why there's, um, uh, there's an increase over time but the, 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 new, uh, the new number is somewhat static and, and we've got an issue with people discontinuing treatment uh, and then re-entering treatment. Um, uh, the endark folks and, and a few notable staff specialists have also reported on um, on injecting of methadone and buprenorphine uh, in a post marketing study um, that uh, that was required as part of the um, registration for buprenorphine naloxone um, and you you you'll see and you can be aware that there's um, a problem or there is there's re reports of injecting of both methadone of course and of buprenorphine uh, and the buprenorphine mono um, preparation is injected more than buprenorphine naloxone and, and the rate um, of buprenorphine naloxone injection is somewhat similar to, to methadone. Interestingly the same um, the same uh, paper reported on dosing supervision uh, from asking patients uh, how many how many non-supervised or takeaway doses they were getting, and you can see that um, that uh, where as a system, uh, at least when this paper was reported, far better at uh, allowing methadone takeaways than we are at allowing buprenorphine takeaways, and and we um, allow a considerable number of methadone takeaways, and that does have um, some public health concerns at times. So, so just quickly to sort of sum up some of the issues with um, the pros and cons of opiate treatment in Australia. So opiate treatment is relatively accessible, at least in metropolitan areas. I know um, it's not the case in rural areas, but it's relatively accessible in metropolitan areas. And we do have this mixed model, it's different a little bit from state to state, of, of different types of service delivery, including integration into primary care, which is probably a good thing overall. Uh, and of course, importantly, we've got treatment in jails, um, so patients can continue treatment when they end up in jail. Um, specifically thinking about buprenorphine, uh, so one of the issues I think I've shown is the retention isn't as good as methadone is. Um, there's a less severe withdrawal, at least from short-term dosing. Uh, a study hasn't demonstrated that it is from longer-term dosing. Uh, maybe this translates to one of the reasons that retention isn't good. Maybe it's something that patients favour and they can they can dish, continue treatment when they want it easier, uh, more easily than they can compared to, to methadone. Um, many, but some complain about the taste of the buprenorphine, buprenorphine naloxone, um, the sublingual administration. Um, some people don't like uh, diversion to, to non-medical use is a problem, especially in some settings and, and most especially in jails. We know there's significant um, non-medical use of buprenorphine films in jails. And again, this issue of costs that I brought up before, it's a significant barrier. And 
um, something like a third of all patients who are dropping out of treatment are dropping out of treatment because they can't afford the costs um, of um, pharmacy fees. And, and you'll be aware of the typical pattern of people running up bills at pharmacies and then one day for, for whatever reason, the pharmacists then decide that's enough. They're, they're um, not gonna accept the bill running up anymore and the patient's told them not to come back for treatment. Um, so this is uh, not, not only inequity, but um, uh, I guess a, a failure part of our, as part of our system. Uh, methadone treatment, um, uh, the, the pros and cons with that, I guess in, in terms of the pros, clearly it's effective treatment. Uh, it was the first treatment. So uh, in some ways the gold standard treatment uh, but the burden of daily dosing, um, and again, the cost issue as exists for methadone is a problem. Uh, and there are, there are public health problems um, with non-supervised doses. We know that there's um, diversion injecting and every now and then we hear of child deaths and um, they're, they're generally, of course, catastrophic events, but also very bad press for um, methadone treatment. And we did did see a situation about a decade ago in New South Wales where we were close to um, losing the capacity to provide takeaway doses. So it, it's a significant public health problem from time to time. So depobuprenorphine, um, first reported two papers in the literature a little over a decade ago. Um, the potential advantages of, of depobuprenorphine um, is certainly this uh, decreased burden associated with daily dosing, both for staff and for patients. Um, decreased risk of non-medical use, um, more stable blood buprenorphine levels, and treatment that there's less structured around um, this issue of attendance for daily dosing. There's two different studies um, uh, that I just put up to, to, uh, to highlight the pharmacokinetics of buprenorphine. So you see the one on your left. Um, so this is a study of sublingual buprenorphine and, and the, peak, um, the peak period you know, is typically around about four hours, two hours to four hours post dose and it starts to uh, decrease after that um, over the following 24 hours. The graph on the right is an example of one of the depobuprenorphine um, preparations, and you can see the curve can be similar because there, there's in that, that one has both a weekly preparation and a monthly preparation. But the, the shape of the curve is the same, although note that the y-axis is um, exponential here; it's not um, linear like the one on the left. Uh, and you get that that uh, slower extension, but over a much much longer period of time. So that's the pharmacokinetic, the general pharmacokinetic approach to um, to a depot preparation. There's two companies that currently have um, produced depot buprenorphine injections, so long-acting buprenorphine injections. Um, there's the Swedish group, the Cameras group. Um, Brayburn is a, a partner in the USA, so you might hear me talk about Brayburn occasionally. Uh, that's been recently um, called bu Buvidal Weekly and Buvidal Monthly, um, CAM2038. Uh, it's also a name that's, that's been used and you'll see in some of the publications for, for this preparation. So that's one. Um, and the other is the uh, Indivio product. Indivio, of course, clearly was um, Rickett Van Kaiser previously. So the manufacturers of buprenorphine in the, the tablets, Subutex and Suboxone in Australia. And their long-acting um, preparation has been recently called Sublockade. Uh, and also you'll see in the literature, RBP6000 was the... Um, the pharma name for it before they came up with the trade name. So the principle of these medications is uh, buprenorphine essentially mixed with other um, non-psychotic substances to uh, allow them to be released slowly and over a longer period of time. Um, typically small volume, so from 0.2 of a mil to one and a half mil, subcutaneous injections, um, and, and just note there's, there's no uh, naloxone contained in these because it's not required to, they're not trying to prevent um, uh, in, injection by, uh, by diversion of a, a sublingual type route. Um, so I'll talk to you about Sublocate or the RBP6000 first. So this is the Indivia um, preparation. Um, so they've mixed buprenorphine with this biodegradable polymer called Atrogel. Atrogel is used in a few other medications. There's a chemotherapeutic agent for uh, prostate cancer and I think a preparation with azithromycin for long-acting um, 
uh, preparations of, of both of those drugs. Um, so atrogel mixed with an active drug, um, uh, and it does uh, it dissolves it's dissolved in NMP in methyl pyrrolidone, uh, a water miscible biocompatible solvent. So their approach um, essentially is to have two doses. Um, a 300 milligram dose and a 100 milligram dose, and they've got a one month depot, and I'll talk a bit about the dosing structure and why they've got those doses in a moment. Uh, and so this is subcutaneous injection, 0.5 mil for the 100 mig, um, 1.5 mil for the 300 mig. Uh, and the recommended dosing regimen is to start patients on the 300 milligram dose uh, for three months, uh, and then patients can continue on 300 milligrams or decrease to 100 milligrams. Um, cold chain storage is required for this um, preparation. It can have about a week outside of a fridge, but, but uh, beyond that needs cold chain um, storage. Uh, there's phase studies um, completed March or April this year. Um, and a um, uh, TGA registration and PBAC application have been commenced in Australia. So just to talk to you about um, some of the studies. Um, so this is a published study um, of um, RBP 6000. Uh, and you'll see essentially this study um, is demonstrating um, that if you give um, patients hydromorphone, um, so that's a potent opiate full mu agonist. Uh, patients can feel it and they get up, they, they can report a positive drug effect, uh, and that can occur on giving suboxone film as well. So, suboxone film doesn't um, fully ameliorate the positive drug effect, but if you then um, stabilize them on RBP 6000, this blocks um, the hydromorphone positive effect uh, at six milligram doses and uh, 18 milligram doses of um, hydromorphone. Um, and this blockade function can occur over, not just short term, but over multiple weeks if the drug's continued and the, um, the blockade effects lasts uh, over time. So from week to week throughout the uh, interdosing period, the one month period. So the phase three study, um, not yet in the peer review literature. Um, I've seen it presented at a couple of conferences and thanks to Indivia for this slide uh, and is in the process of being submitted, I think has been submitted for publication. Um, so essentially th this study looked at two different dosing, uh, so it was a three-armed randomised control trial, two different dosing regimens of um, RBP 6000, the 300 um, milligram consistently for six months uh, and then the 300 milligram for two months, followed by 100 milligrams for four months, and compared that to placebo. Uh, and it was a group of adult, you know, adults, opiate dependent, that was enrolled in the trial, um, 500 odd patients. Um, now the graph on your left may be a little bit hard uh, to understand, but if you think of it as the area under the curve um, is the, the total of number of morphine negative urines uh, and self-report. Um, so it's a, it's a conservative measure of success of a medication in terms of opiate use at least. Uh, you can see that um, the placebo group does very poorly. They have very few opiate negative urines uh, and the um, RBP 6,300 uh, milligram consistently or two lots of 300 then the 100 have, um, have equivalent uh, effects in terms of opiate negative urines and that's around about the 40-ish um, percent over the, the, the total study period. The mean, sorry, the mean percentage absence is over that study period. Um, the other key thing, uh, and again, just thinking in Divya for this slide, um, is to think about adverse events. And the key adverse events uh, you get from an subcutaneous injectable drug are, are uh, injected related side effects, not unsurprisingly. So you'll see, and just remember this figure, around about 10 to 20% of patients report um, injecting side effects. Um, so pain, swelling, redness, those sorts of things. Uh, they didn't, uh, there, there were no reports of serious um, injecting related uh, treatment emergent side effects in this study. 
So I'm now switched to talking about the, the Swedish uh, medication, CAM2038 or Buvidel. Um, so this is uh, buprenorphine mixed with liquid crystals uh, and they have um, two different um, glycerol products or soy products uh, mixed with ethanol for the weekly preparation or NMP for the monthly preparation. Uh, they're small volume, so 0.18 um, to 0.64 mil subcutaneous injections. Uh, no cold chain storage is required um, for this preparation. Uh, and there's flexible dose preparations. Um, the weekly has a 16, um, a 24 and a 32 milligram dose. The eight milligram dose is really there as a top up dose. Uh, and monthly 64, 96 and 128 milligrams. And essentially this dose range is equivalent to low dose um, sublingual buprenorphine to high dose sublingual buprenorphine um, for one week or for four weeks. Um, so there's a phase three um, study that's been completed and reported. I'll talk to you about it in a moment and a one year safety study. And uh, that, that was across three countries, including Australia. And I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the results from that. Um, so they've uh, commenced and uh, the European agency's recommended registration, uh, FDA and applications been made and in Australia, TGA registration and a PBAC application uh, are underway. So just quickly, um, similar, you'll see to, uh, the, the graph looks a bit different, but similar design. Um, to the, the Indivia study. Um, so, so this study led by Sharon Walsh is looking at, again, that blockade effect. So if you give patients hydromorphone, um, they, they're aware of it, they get a positive OP effect, they can report that. And then if you give CAM 2038, um, you'll see this is the weekly dose, the 24 or the 32, um, it suppresses that effect. So, so they can't feel the um, positive effect of, of opiates. Uh, on a number of different measures of, of um, good drug effect or drug liking or bad drug effect, uh, it, it's blocked under all of those different conditions. You'll also see that um, patients don't complain of opiate withdrawal um, in the interdosing period uh, and, and get acceptable um, blood buprenorphine levels. So, um, this study is the uh, the phase three study. So this was uh, 430 odd patients. Uh, it was a randomized controlled trial of sublingual buprenorphine um, versus depot. Uh, so there was 12 weeks of weekly depot and then um, 12 weeks of monthly depot. Um, and 70% uh, of the enrollment group were primary heroin users. So the retention in treatment uh, was around about 70% at um, 24 weeks. Sorry again. Um, so you'll see the uh, CDF, so the um, cumulative distribution function, essentially again, the number of opiate um, negative urines. Um, the line with sublingual buprenorphine is slightly lower than that of subcutaneous buprenorphine. Indeed, this was statistically significantly different. Uh, so both the 1 to 24 week analysis um, and the, uh, the 4 to 24 week uh, analysis was different. If you, in particular, um, the, the, the graph on the left is probably a better way of trying to express that. And you'll see in those different groups, you get a higher proportion of opiate negative um, urines, with, uh, including self-report, with the, the um, depot buprenorphine preparation compared to the sublingual um, preparation. And then an, another post hoc analysis looking at the injectors uh, in the study. So about half the study were injectors. We see the injectors did particularly well um, on the depot preparation compared to um, to the non injectors, and they um, they had about twice as many um, opiate negative urines and self report. Um, and similarly, again showed. Um, uh, suppressed opiate withdrawal scale, so people weren't getting opiate withdrawal in the interdosing period, um, and also some statistically significant time points of um, of opiate negative urines in the um, favouring the um, depot group over the sublingual buprenorphine uh, group. 
Uh, and then thanks to, um, to Cameras for this slide. Uh, it's being submitted for publication. So they did a, a, a one-year safety study as well. That's uh, typically required by um, the US regulator, the FDA now. Uh, interesting to note, so not all of these patients are new to treatment, but interesting to note that at 48 weeks, the um, proportion enrolled in treatment, remaining in treatment was, was um, quite high at 73%. Um, so that's, that's reasonably good for opiate treatment. Um, so this study allowed new patients to enrol or patients from the previous study to, to remain in treatment uh, and to look at safety issues. Uh, the, the slide, the graphic down the bottom is remarkable. So over 80% of patients um, were very satisfied with that treatment. They thought it was much better than previous treatment. Um, and then looking at adverse events, because that, that was a, the chief aim of this study, uh, you'll see that injection related side effects, again, it's around about that 20% mark, uh, and it's predominantly pain and swelling and erythema. Um, and the, um, uh, the patients are typically reporting the sort of severity of um, injection related effects that you might get from a flu vaccine or, or something like that, you know, a little bit of soreness, a little bit of pain, a little bit of redness um, from time to time over the injection site, but not major problems that, um, that result in people discontinuing um, treatment for injection related side effects at least. So just very quickly, I thought um, I'd walk you through. So there were um, 29 participants in the uh, Australian study in this um, safety study, uh, the, the um, Swedish uh, Buvidel, and uh, we had 10 of them in Newcastle. So I thought I'd just quickly um, give you some case uh, anecdotes uh, to give you a flavour of what providing treatment was like. So one case, a pseudonym of course, uh, Donna, 41 year old female, uh, was already on buprenorphine sublingual film with this 24 milligrams daily, uh, had had a history of opiate use uh, over several decades, including street buprenorphine use, uh, hadn't been using heroin regularly for the past several years, um, had been an amphetamine user but wasn't currently, um, had had a history of benzodiazepine use, including benzodiazepine injecting, but, but hadn't used for over a decade now. Cannabis use uh, previously, um, some low level alcohol use, uh, and it stopped smoking. So that's quite remarkable in our patient group. Um, and good. Um, had been on methadone treatment in early 20s, uh, had relapsed uh, and recommenced buprenorphine treatment six years previously uh, when, a part, when she became pregnant and a partner started into the treatment as well. So she was. Um, uh, doing progressing very well in treatment, dosing at a community pharmacy on 24 milligrams, um, collecting daily uh, good adherence to treatment, um, had a number of medical conditions, um, essentially relatively stable though overall and was on uh, a few medications, amitriptyline, perindopril and salbutamol and some inhaled steroids from time to time, um, some mental health history but, but wasn't uh, a major problem, was living in um, department housing. Um, so she commenced on the monthly um, 128 milligram dose of um, CAM 2038 uh, and at week 10 titrated up to the 160 milligram dose um, that she remained. Um, and, and interesting, and this happened to a couple of patients in, in, um, in the study, so, you know, very small numbers, so I don't want to make too much of it, but but she came and said to us, look, I'm really enjoying not coming to your clinic on a regular basis um, for dosing or to the pharmacy rather for dosing. Um, and uh, I, I decided I needed to do something. So I got myself a job. So we, our, our staff weren't involved in trying to help um, gain employment for her. She did that all of her own bat uh, and good on her for doing so. But it gives you an idea of people's, the, the focus of, uh, of some patient's life possibly changing when treatment's not structured around this issue of daily attendance for dosing. Uh, another chap I'll talk to you about quickly, not quite as, uh, as stable on intake at least. Sam, 47 year old male, um, came in from the waiting list, so um, uh, wasn't currently in treatment, was living by himself, uh, a strong family history of substance use, alcohol and other drugs, um, and a daughter with little, little uh, current contact, um, been using again for several decades, was using a couple of times a day, had used street bup and street MS cotton before, uh, was currently uh, injecting methamphetamine, two points, hundred dollars worth a day. Um, uh, previous use of alcohol, a little bit of tobacco use, um, had been on methadone before it stopped. Um, some significant uh, medical conditions, including chronic hepatitis B, um, 
So he uh, commenced the depot treatment, uh, decided that he wanted to stay on the weekly um, preparation, so stayed on the weekly preparation. Um, essentially, there were no episodes of opiate use uh, in the 48 weeks he was on the trial. Um, his methamphetamine use did continue, and uh, we saw him regularly and talked about that. Um, it, it decreased in intensity, so it wasn't it was no longer daily. It was a couple of times a week. Um, he had uh, one admission to hospital with pneumonia. Um, and uh, uh, transferred back to sublingual buprenorphine after the trial. So I thought I'd just give you a couple of those as, um, as some flavour to how patients might progress. Um, I think it's, uh, it's pretty natural for both patients and staff to be a little bit anxious the first time. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, a, it's common for... Um, for staff and patients to be a little bit anxious um, starting depot treatment. They have never been on it before. Is it really going to work? Is it really going to last? But um, pretty early in treatment, uh, our experience at least was the patients were very satisfied uh, and really enjoyed not coming to see us regularly. So I just want to briefly talk um, to you about some current Australian studies uh, and then talk a bit about implications. And so we've got some time for questions. So. Um, uh, one, the first study is um, DEBUT is the um, acronym for the study. So this is a randomised trial of sublingual um, buprenorphine compared to depot buprenorphine. Um, Nicolinzeris is the PI, Cameras is the study sponsor. Um, it's occurring at the Langton Centre, uh, Royal Prince Alfred, uh, Blacktown, Newcastle, Adelaide uh, and Turning Point in Melbourne. Uh, participants are 120. Um, randomised to either sublingual um, or to, uh, to depot. Um, they can be patients currently in treatment or new patients new to treatment. Uh, a bunch of measures have been collected, including satisfaction, substance use, safety, uh, retention treatment, uh, quality of life outcomes. Uh, and that study's commenced treatment. I think there's um, somewhere between five and 10 patients uh, enrolled and randomised so far. Uh, and so that um, will continue up to mid next year. Um, there's a study that I'm the um, PI on. So this is uh, in custodial settings in New South Wales. Um, so this is a study in seven or eight jails in New South Wales. And it, the, the key aim is to look at safety issues in a custodial setting. Um, so in theory, uh, in, injectable depopuprenorphine is non-divertible, um, um, can't be aspirated out, can't be used by others. Um, so we're gonna implement this in jail. Um, and, uh, and see what happens. And also um, look at some uh, health cost measures and, and prison cost measures, because one of the key problems with providing up a treatment in prison is there's a lot of uh, correctional officer guard time running people back and forth on a daily basis to get their doses, but there's also a lot of justice health time and, uh, and it can prevent other treatment being provided. And there's also a, a problem with the capacity in, in, in prison. So this may be an answer there. Uh, and then the third trial is an implementation trial. Um, this is um, being led um, from uh, Mike and the folks at NDARC. Uh, New, New South Wales is the sponsor and Divya has funded the study. Um, and it's a single arm multi-site study, open label study of 12 monthly injections of an extended release um, buprenorphine. So the sub blockade, 300, 300, and then it can be 300 or 100 milligrams. Um, 48 week retention and uh, four to six sites are in the process of being selected, looking at, at different types of service delivery. So specialist clinics, GPs, uh, et cetera, public clinics, um, pharmacy, uh, et cetera. So I guess now just to start to get you to think about some of the implications of buprenorphine for our treatment system here. Um, so it's likely, um, and we don't have exact dates yet, but it's likely in either 2019 or 2020, um, we'll uh, be seeing these medications uh, becoming available to us. Um, so there's some work to be done. Certainly there's some work to be done in um, preparing guidelines. We don't have um, guidelines yet. We need guidelines in providing treatment and we'll have to think about what sort of training system we want, um, presuming that we want one. I think we want some sort of training system. Uh, so people feel comfortable and, in, and competent in prescribing um, depobuprenorphine when that comes on board. Um, 
So applications are being made, I understand, under the PBS Section 100 system, so that's the system that's being used currently for methadone and fibuprenorphine. Um, the benefit of that, of course, is that the federal government's um, absorbing or, or paying for the full cost of the medication uh, and providing delivery to hospitals and, and public clinics. Um, so uh, at least in a public clinic setting um, or in a hospital setting, uh, the medication can be provided free of cost to the patient. This, uh, and, and possibly also so in private clinics. Um, the system of delivery, to, delivery in the community needs to be worked out and, and uh, I understand there's considerable work being done on that now. Um, and I think one of the potential key advantages of deaf people is if there's a way um, that delivery can occur to, um, to primary care settings, to GP surgeries, um, then this could really considerably um, impact on the cost that patients currently pay for treatment. Now, uh, there needs to be some clarity about who's, who's bearing the cost of the delivery, that needs to be sorted out. Um, but there's a, a potential for a, a significant gain there for patients. Uh, there's also lots of logistics to be worked out. Um, uh, who will be providing the medication? Clearly, doctors can provide injections. Nurses, uh, practice nurses, uh, often provide injections in community settings. So maybe we'll see more of a growth of that. Um, if the medication, and if we can work out the systems that uh, uh, don't cost as much or maybe a cost fee in terms of patients not having to pay for the pharmacy fee that they currently do and essentially observing the dosing and, and doing the bookkeeping, um, that might provide a significant incentive for patients to, uh, to seek depobuprenorphine treatment over other forms of treatment. There's also particular settings where it might um, become first-line treatment. So you can imagine in jail, if it's successful, uh, it would be the preferred treatment. Uh, why? take somebody on a daily basis to, uh, to get dosed if you can do it once a month. Uh, interstate travel could become much easier. Uh, providing treatment in rural areas where there's one or no pharmacies um, uh, could, be, could become much, uh, much easier. Extreme weather events, I've been in, involved in a couple of floods now, but fires and other things, um, getting medication to patients is, uh, can be a, a big problem, including opiate treatment. Um, so this could have some real advantages in those sorts of situations. Um, the, the possible uh, de development of this as a withdrawal treatment is another thing to, to consider. Um, so thanks to, to Nick for the next couple of slides. So um, there's a whole bunch of implications around how we currently structure treatment and how this could be um, quite different um, to what we've been used to. Um, and could be very liberating for some patients, maybe less good for other um, patients. Um, we've got to work out how we get patients onto it and certainly if we've got to swap patients from methadone, how that might happen and back onto methadone if that needs to happen. Chronic pain, we need to think about that and how we manage people with episodes, severe episodes of acute pain while they're on um, long-acting depot products. So there's uh, a, a long list of things for us to consider. Uh, and one way to think about um, uh, depot treatment is that uh, it could be a significant disruptor um, to how treatment's currently provided. Again, thanks to Nick for the slide. Um, uh, but all sorts of things that we haggle about with our patients now, we might not need to do. Um, all sorts of concerns about congregation, uh, missed doses, management of missed doses, um, takeaway monitoring, all of these things are, are, are under a, a scheme where a patient's attending essentially once a month to get a, an injection, once a week or once a month to get an injection, uh, are quite different. Um, so this um, actually could help us really change how we provide treatment, how we think about treatment, and some of the stigma uh, currently associated with treatment. Uh, there's certainly a whole lot of thought that needs to go into um, supply chains and uh, beyond public clinic settings, how it could be delivered uh, beyond public clinic settings. Um, questions too, um, can, could pharmacists admit to this, administer this? Um, it's possible, uh, regulation change and maybe legislation change would need to occur in some, uh, probably all states for that to occur, but it's not, uh, it's not an impossible thing. Um, 
So, uh, and I put this up just to be a little bit provocative, how might treatment look in another 10 years time? Um, we might have a much higher proportion of GPs with small caseloads and buprenorphine only. We do, um, in New South Wales at least, have the ability for GPs to commence treatment without having to have done a mandatory training course now and they can provide up to treatment for up to 20 patients. So maybe we'll see a growth in that. Uh, we might see buprenorphine depot treatment widely accepted uh, with cost as a key driver. Uh, we might start to rethink methadone not as the first line treatment, but as a second line treatment for those who aren't able to stabilise on buprenorphine. Uh, we might see a reallocation of public clinic resources. So the many hours, um, staff hours now that we spend um, dosing our methadone and buprenorphine on a daily basis, we might be able to cut back on that and allow our nurses to um, do other important things with patients. Um, maybe even to uh, be providing some of the outreach uh, services to assist depot buprenorphine be provided in community settings. A whole bunch of things to, to think about. So I'm going to stop now and uh, we've got uh, I think just over a quarter of an hour for treatment and uh, very happy to take questions. Okay, and I can see, so I don't know if people, um, they're posting questions, okay. So I'll just go through one by one. Um, so James has asked, depot injection seems overwhelmingly positive. Any idea of when and how we can access this in Australia? So uh, both um, Camerus and Indivio have made applications to the TGA um, and uh, I understand applications to the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Um, we'll hear more um, later this year and or next year about what the timelines uh, are likely to be, but um, I think it's reasonable to say 2019, uh, maybe 2020, um, uh, it's the, the timelines for both medications may not be the same and there's decisions that the um, TGA and PBS have got to make, but I think, uh, I think it's reasonable to think somewhere between, you know, up to um, 18 months is, is probably the longest period of time that we um, would be waiting. Uh, the second one, lots of reference to blood buprenorphine levels. These do not reflect activity since it is CNS levels which matter. Not realistic measurable in humans. Um, yeah, so you'll notice um, that um, the, the doses of the medications are, um, are quite different. Um, the individual product has a 300 milligrams and a 100 milligram preparation, and then the Camera's product has um, different um, different um, doses. Can, if it, depending if it's a weekly or if it's a monthly preparation, um, and this goes back to uh, I guess both the characteristics of the long-acting preparations. They've got the bioavailability, but also the design of what the different companies were trying to achieve. So my understanding of the Indivior product um, relates to uh, a, a bunch of studies done looking at receptor occupation um, and cravings and opiate use. Uh, and their aim was to achieve higher levels of, um, of blood buprenorphine. Now I take the point that that's not uh, CNS levels, but there's some relationship between CNS levels and blood levels. Um, so that was that's that's why they have a much higher dose. The um, bioavailability of the, the Swedish product, the CAM 2038, um, is different to um, uh, to the uh, individual product, but they they similarly um, can provide um, adequate blood levels and. And uh, if you've got a particular interest, it's worth looking up some of the pharmacokinetic studies that have been reported. There's certainly a number of studies of both preparations. Um, now that I can see a whole lot more questions um, appearing, I'll try to be a little bit quicker um, on each of the answers. Opiate negative urines are less important than the opiates when are blocked by the drug of interest. Participants may well test the possibility of using them. Yeah, I, so I think it's reasonable to say that um, that uh, approach of um, 
of opiate negative urines and negative self-report is uh, a very conservative analysis and that it's not um, the practice all of the time that that means there's ongoing regular opiate use. So it's a conservative. Um, so just moving on to the to the next question then about um, discharge from hospital. Um, so yeah, we're, this will be challenging patients on long acting depot preparations requiring um, significant analgesia um, will be more challenging. Um, it already happens with um, sublingual buprenorphine, although granted that you can wait for the sublingual to, to stop working over a day or more. Um, and the duration is much longer here, but there are other approaches to um, analgesia and uh, uh, it's certainly the intent of um, at least one of the studies, the debut study, to try to document that whenever it occurs uh, and it may be in the sub study as well. Um, so we can get some clinical data about how do we manage these situations and how do we better respond to them. Um, uh, the question about cessation of treatment with depobuprenorphine. Um, so we haven't had patients um, suddenly discontinuing yet, uh, in, at least in 